Uh, my name is Sebastian Matteau. I, I recently joined the experimental psychology unit here in Groningen. And uh, today it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about, uh, about what the advantages and the disadvantages of having, uh, having large pupils. Now, uh, so they're going to put this on YouTube, so a substantial part of the slides are going to feature cats, about a third. Uh, so uh, if, you look at this, if you look at this cat, would you say that that's a very relaxed kitty? Right? He's, uh, I think he's kind of adorable, but imagine that you're, you would try to scratch his head. Do you think that he would respond more or less like this, being very calmly uh, enjoying the cuddles? Or if you just especially looking at his enormously dilated pupils that you see here, is there a chance that if you try to scratch his adorable little head that he would respond more or less like this? I think, personally, I would rather not try to scratch that cat. Because you can, you can clearly see, based on the, the dilated pupils of that cat, that he's very emotional, right? He's either afraid or he, he's angry or he's a little bit of both maybe. But in general, and I, I think we intuitively feel that, the dilated pupils, they, they signal emotion, right? They signal, in the case of that cat, they signal that he's afraid or angry. But they, they can also signal positive emotions, not just negative ones. And uh, you may notice this, this is kind of like a, a cocktail party anecdote, a story of Italian women uh, during the Renaissance who used a particular kind of eye drops based on, uh, based on the, the herb that you see here, that's called belladonna. And they, they made eye drops out of that and put it in their eyes, and that caused their, their, their pupils to dilate. And they did that to make them appear more appealing to men, presumably because those dilated pupils suggested to the men that they were very interested, right? So that was a kind of a, a very poisonous, I should say. It's also called deadly nightshade, so you, you, it's really a bad idea to put it in your eyes. But they used it kind of as a cosmetic. Uh, and the Japanese have taken this, uh, this principle, of course, uh, even, even much further in the form of anime. Here you see this, uh, this girl with enormously large eyes, and within those enormously large eyes, enormously large pupils. And I kind of did a quick back-of-the-envelope calculation. I think that her pupils are roughly the size of the pupil of a blue whale in real life. So that is the largest mammal on Earth. It's not, it's not drawn to scale, huh? let's put it like that. But nevertheless, it works, right? It conveys a very strong sense of emotion. And also, if you see it, it kind of triggers strong emotion uh, in, the, in the viewer. It's kind of an appealing type of images, partly because of those dilated pupils. Now, and the, the, those are a whole bunch of words to just say the very simple point, uh, summarized uh, a long time ago by Irene Lewenfeld, who is like the godmother of uh, pupillometry, so the, one of the founding uh, mothers of the science of pupil size, who said that men may either blush or turn pale when emotionally agitated, but his pupils always dilate, right? So, so if you experience some kind of emotion, be it a negative or a positive emotion, your, your pupils will get bigger. Now, uh, we know that, we intuitively feel that, we know that it's true, but why does that happen, right? What, what is the purpose of this, what is the function of this pupillary dilation if we get uh, emotional? And I think if you want to understand that, we have to take a step back and first consider the way that the pupil responds to, to light, to the, pupil, the pupillary light response. Now, if, you, uh, if you're out in the dark, right, and I, you know that, your pupil becomes big, your pupils dilate, right, in darkness compared, of course, to when it's bright and your pupils constrict. They become very, very small. And this dilation of the pupil in response to darkness and constriction of the pupil in response to uh, brightness is called the pupillary light response. A very big response that you can see in someone else's eyes with, uh, with, just with your naked eye. Huh? Now, why does the pupil respond in that way to light? Uh, again, to, to sort of understand that, we need to make a list of the advantages and the disadvantages of, uh, of large and small pupils. And the obvious advantage of a dilated pupil, of a large pupil, is that it captures a lot of light, right? Because the pupil, the only thing that the pupil is, is just the entry point into the eye. So if the pupil opens up, more light shines into the eye, more light falls on the retina in, your back, in the back of your eye, right? So you capture more light, and that's generally a good thing. But there's also the downside, namely that large pupils give you very blurry vision. Just like, for example, if you have a camera and you open up the camera aperture of the camera, the photo becomes a little bit, bit blurry, right? It's just because the lens is not perfect, and the larger the part of the lens is that is used, the more blurry a photo becomes, but also the more blurry vision becomes. So that's the downside of having a large pupil. 
And another downside, again, due to the optics, the way the, that the pupil works optically, is that the large pupil has only a very restricted depth of field, meaning that you can only see sharply at a relatively restricted range of distances. So there's a small depth of field if your pupil is large. And then, of course, for a small pupil, the situation is reversed, right? So the obvious downside is that the small pupil doesn't capture a lot of light. So if it's very dark outside and your pupil is also small, then there's just not a lot, enough light falling on your retina to see anything. Obviously not good. But as soon as there is enough light, a small pupil gives you the sharpest possible image, right? So small pupils make you, allow you to see very sharply. And small pupils also give you this large depth of field, right? So they allow you to see relatively sharply at a wider uh, range of distances. Now, and the idea is that the pupillary light response is sort of a, 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 an optimal point in the trade-off between these advantages and these disadvantages. So if it's very dark, then basically your eyes have no, ch no other option but to dilate as much as possible and to capture as much light as possible, because in darkness, that's the only way to see even anything, right? But if it's very bright, then there is so much light available that even the tiniest pupil still allows sufficient light to enter the eye, and then the pupil constricts so that you get the sharpest possible, uh, possible image. And any kind of luminance range in between sort of results in an intermediate pupil size, right? So it's kind of an optimal point in the trade-off. So that we kind of think more or less that we understand why the pupil responds to light. But if that's true, so if pupils indeed take on the optimal, pu optimal size given how much light there is available, then why do our pupils dilate if we get emotional and aroused? Right? So, why, so right now my pupils have a particular si size, probably a little bit dilated because I'm, I'm nervous standing in front of you. But what's, what's, what's the advantage of my pupil opening up even more, apparently becoming less optimal? Right? That seems to be kind of strange. And my, uh, my idea, one, one of the things that we're currently trying to test, is that there is actually not one particular optimal pupil size, but your optimal pupil size just depends on the situation in which you are. And the idea is very simple. Uh, small pupils, as I said, they give you sharp vision, right? So they, they, they allow you to see small things relatively well. Uh, and that's exactly the kind, of, the kind of thing that you need if you're in a situation that is generally accompanied by calmness, right? For example, imagine that you're reading a book, like here. That's kind of a situation in which you're calm, and that's also the type of situation in which you really need this fine discrimination that small pupils give you. And if you compare that to situations in which your pupil that are arousing, those are generally the type of si types of situations that, that don't really require you to do any kind of fine discrimination, but they require you to be very vigilant, right? Very on guard, able to detect all kinds of things that happen in your environment. And that's exactly the type of thing that you're good at if your pupil is relatively dilated, relatively big, and thus capturing all the visual information that you can. So the idea is that your pupils just automatically take on a small size if sharp vision is what you need in a particular situation, or uh, a large size if this kind of being able to detect things is what you need in a particular situation. Now, uh, how can we test this empirically? It's kind of a difficult hypothesis to test, huh? let's be honest about that, but we can nevertheless try to test this empirically. And what we can do is experiments of the following kind, in which we look at the effect of pupil size on the performance of participants while they are performing some kind of task, different kinds of tasks. So we're really going to manipulate pupil size. And in the experiment that, or the experiment that I will, will show here, we manipulated pupil size by changing the amount of ambient lightning, right? So sometimes there was a bit of dry, br brightness in the periphery of the participant, and sometimes there was darkness in the periphery of the participant. And then we see that affects the size of the pupil, and then we see how in turn that affects the performance on different tasks. And then we compare one task like this, a task in which participants need to detect a stimulus that can appear anywhere, right? So at an unpredictable location, and it's very difficult to see, and they really have to respond to it when they see it. And that's kind of the kind of task that's sort of a model for arousal be behavior that you would exhibit in an arousing situation, right? You're really on guard trying to, de to, to detect things that are going on around you. And then we would predict that, that participants can do this task particularly well when their pupil is big, right? And we compare, compare that to another task in which they have to discriminate a very simple stimulus that is presented in central vision, so it's always at the same location, and it's very fine-grained, fine a very fine stimulus, so it's kind of like reading in a way, uh, that requires sharp vision, and we expect the participants to be better at this, this task, especially when they have a very small pupil.
right? So we expect the effect of pupil size to differ between these two tasks. Now, what happens if we actually do this experiment? So I'll show you uh, a bit of actual data, but I'll, I'll be gentle. On the, on the y-axis, we have the performance of the participants. And on the x-axis, we have pupil size, which we manipulated, right? So it is a experiment, proper experimental study. And on the left side, it will be small pupils. On the right side, will be big pupils. And then we're first going to take a look at this task in which they did this central discrimination, right? So this, this task that's kind of a model for calm, focused behavior. And then we see the following. So the, the dotted lines are the individual participants. So this is the kind of experiment where we test, or we actually, yeah, we helped with that, test the, test the small group of participants for a very long time. So the dotted lines are participants. And the solid line is the, is the group mean. And you see that in this case, there's actually not really any dependency of performance on pupil size, right? So regardless of whether the pupil is big or small, participants are able to do the central discrimination task about equally well. Not entirely what I predicted, right? I predicted actually that the performance would be a little bit better if their pupil size was small. But that's not really the case. The line is more or less flat. But if we compare that to the other task, the task that is, that is this model for a vigilant, uh, sort of an arousing situation, we see that there is now a very strong dependency of accuracy on pupil size. And you really see that if pupil size is big, uh, participants do very well on this task compared to when pupil size is small. Right? And again, pupil size is big because we manipulated it. We don't just record spontaneous, spontaneous fluctuations in pupil size. We manipulate pupil size ourselves. So pupil size does have an effect on performance. And the effect that pupil size has on performance is different for different situations. So what we, can we conclude in general? Well, it's clear, I think, that pupil size is a very... F pupil, the pupil responds very flexibly to all kinds of things, right? It, it adapts to our environment in the sense that if, uh, if we're in a bright environment, our pupils become small so that we have the sharpest possible vision. Well, if we're out in darkness, the pupils open up to capture as much light as possible, right? So that we're still able to see something, even though that goes obviously at the expense of being able to see sharply. And well, we know this, for, we've known this for quite a long time, but what we're currently also gradually uh, discovering is that the pupil also adapts to the more sort of cognitive demands on the situation of the situation, namely that if you're in a situation that requires you to be very calmly focused on something, your pupils become relatively small so that you can do some fine discrimination. Whereas if you're in a, in a situation that requires you to be very vigilant, to be very on guard, your pupils open up so that you're best able to discriminate or to detect stimuli that appear can appear anywhere. Right? And I think that's probably the explanation of why your pupils dilate if you get aroused. Because in arousing situations, that's generally the type of vision that you need, being able to detect things. Now, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you're interested in this general stuff, please uh, visit my website. And uh, that's it. Thank you.